Welcome to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast. I'm your host, Ashley Markle. I'm a Curriculum Development Specialist here at NCBRT, and I work in collaboration with subject matter experts to create valuable and timely training for the responder community. The National Center for Biomedical Research and Training provides mobile training to both the national and international emergency response community. Today, we're talking with Laura Drabchek and Bart Thompson about establishing and managing emergency operations in an institute of higher education during a global pandemic. Laura Drabchek has been with the University of Michigan Dearborn campus for 24 years. She is the Director of Emergency Management at the Dearborn campus and an Associate Director for the Ann Arbor campus as well. She's been working in emergency management for over 10 years. Bart Thompson is the Chief of Police at Louisiana State University. He has 32 years of experience at the Baton Rouge Police Department and has been with LSU for 11 years. We want to thank Laura and Bart for all that they do to keep us safe and for joining us on the podcast and sharing their expertise on this topic. COVID-19 has wreaked havoc on what normal looks like at our institutions of higher education. So Bart, what immediate adjustments have you had to make on your campus, like maybe when it you know, first started really blowing up in the US? The university was uh, basically shut down within a 48 hour time period. Uh, faculty started playing in online courses. Uh, Res Life started relocating students uh, who could not go home. Uh, our campus EOC Emergency Operations Center was activated. Uh, the police department concerns at that time were well risk and manpower. Uh, so we went to a 12 hour shift, which we we're basically still working. Uh, supplies, we started looking at supplies and, and what we need. Uh, we didn't have roll calls that we normally would have. And we started doing wellness checks. Uh, before an officer comes into the building, their temperature is taken and uh, have to fill out a, a basic oral, uh, or, oral uh, interview of what's been going on in their life and family. Can you both tell us a little bit about your universities just you know, if our, our listeners aren't super familiar with, um, you know, the size and, um, you know, composition of the university, can you just give us a little bit of an overview? Because I know, um, Laura, your university is a little bit smaller and might be good to have that context. Yeah, I work for one of the regional campuses within the University of Michigan system. So our campus is approximately 9,000 students with about 1,000 faculty and staff. So relatively uh, small in size compared to the main campus where they have over 40,000 students. Uh, they also have a health system, Michigan Medicine, uh, that's part of you know that composition and you know but we're all one institution we all report through the the regents of the university of michigan and you know we do rely on the services that the main campus provides to us and support from time to time and actually we've identified some of our three deep for certain critical areas within our eoc structure would would rely you know we'd have to rely on ann arbor for that so, you know, we do rely on the main campus, but we try to be as self-sufficient as we can within time. Uh, LSU is the flagship university of the state. Uh, we have six other uh, satellite campuses uh, included in the uh, LSU system, including two hospitals, a large vet school. Uh, we consider ourselves very large within the SEC uh, network. Uh, so we, we feel like we're in the top 10 of of large universities. Uh, and by the way, we are the national championship for football. And if we don't play next year or fall, we'll get to keep that. <laughs> that is true. I didn't think of that. Um, okay, thank you for that. Well, our approach was a little bit different because I think, you know, the state of Michigan came to the table a little bit later in the COVID-19 outbreak, um, later than some other states. And our students were actually on spring break. Um, uh, February 29th, I think through February or through then March 8th. So it looked a little bit different for us because then we did not get our first presumed case in the state of Michigan till the 10th. And by that point, we had already had all of our students back from spring break. So that was met with some interesting challenges for us on the campus. So we had to, to make some quick decisions on what we were going to do as, as next steps, even though we had been meeting and planning prior to. Um, I'd assume each Institute of Higher Education should have a campus emergency operation plan. 
uh, which would cover or which would outline relationships between all the key players throughout the operation, uh, emergency operations center uh, management structure. So can you tell us a little bit about your campus emergency operation plan? Sure, I'd be happy to. So our emergency operation plan is, is pretty comprehensive. It starts off with a, a basic plan. So it's a structure that outlines our process uh, using an all hazards approach. Um, and in, within that, it, uh, it identifies our emergency operation membership and coordination of our EOC. And we've built in a lot of flexibility because we are a relatively small regional campus. Uh, we needed to build in that flexibility so that we can scale based on what the incident was. We've, uh, we're able then to build out a little bit more of that base plan by actually reaching out to key external stakeholders because we recognized early on that no matter what the incident would be, the likelihood would be that we would quickly run out of resources. We did have the luxury over the past uh, year, uh, late into 2018 and through all of, or most of 2019, we were engaged with, with uh, key stakeholders, external stakeholders, hospitals, local police departments, county police departments, federal agencies, because in August of 2019, we uh, did a full scale active shooter exercise. So that really laid some nice groundwork for the relationships that continue through today, especially with our partner, our hospital partners that we have in the area, because they immediately looked to us early on in this pandemic for uh, additional space if they needed to, to build some field hospitals out. And then our plan also identified um, hazard specific annexes so those would be areas and things that we were discussing around fires, pandemics, uh, hazardous material releases. So we had a pretty robust uh, infectious disease uh, pandemic plan, but you know it was met with some challenges when we meant you know when we went to implement it. And then we also have uh, situational annexes that just you know kind of support the base plan and then appendices that you know had a variety of different maps and phone phone trees and things that we needed to, to support that documentation. So overall, I think our, our um, EOP is pretty robust. It worked pretty well for us, but there's been definitely areas that we identified through this process that, that uh, need improvement as I think most plans do. They're just a plan, they're a starting point, they're a launching pad, but it gave us a flexibility to, to expand and contract as we needed to throughout this pandemic. Yeah, similar to Laura, of course, we have a plan, uh, but we had no plan to experience what we're going through now. Hurricanes, yes, uh, but not this. Uh, our operation plan, along with the EOC and MOUs we, we have with DHS, uh, each EOC team, and there's four, has an incident commander or an operations, planning, uh, logistics, finance, and facilities. And once the uh, EOC is activated, uh, then everything is run through the EOC. Uh, we're coming to the table almost daily and, and making changes to that plan because again I don't think anyone uh, has an expert that can say they, uh, they've they experienced what we're going through now. Okay so we, we went into this a little bit um, in that first question but um, how did your plan inform your approach to responding to COVID-19? Bart could you expand a little bit upon that? Yes the the EO, EOC operation works well, but we also have a what we call EOC core team. And the core team is a smaller leadership group, which includes uh, STRATCOM communications on the campus, uh, PD, IT, facilities, and campus life. And this group makes recommendations to the university president. Uh, operation is changing daily based on testing, based on supplies, and the direction of the governor. Uh, currently, the governor just extended our stay at home uh, for two weeks, which was not expected. Uh, so again, we're back to the table and making some changes. I think as Bart just mentioned in his last statement, you know, it's as the governor's making changes and plans to when states can be reopen and how they reopen, we're met with those same challenges because the governor here in Michigan just extended the stay at home order you know, she's gonna allow some construction to begin next week early. So we're planning to, to resume some campus construction. But again, a lot of our planning 
uh, efforts are going to be around what, what we can and can't do based on what the executive orders from the, the governor is. So Laura, you mentioned um, that you've you know, been met with some challenges and had to make some adjustments based on, um, you know, COVID-19 is kind of an unprecedented uh, event. Um, so how did you make adjustments to the plan um, for things that you might not ex have expected? I think we've had to be pretty agile and nimble moving through the process and we had to do a lot of anticipation. We engaged our medical experts that we had within the university system and having Michigan Medicine, which is our health system. It was helpful because we had specialists that, that could help somewhat guide us through some of the, the process and provide as much insight as they could around this virus, even though that information was very limited. But even having that little bit of information was, was extremely helpful. But we did have to pivot a lot through this process as, as we continued to make changes. Well, yes, our biggest adjustment to the plane is, and still is, is supplies. Uh, the, the police department teamed up with NCBRT, who is on the LSU campus uh, within the first 24 hours. And we obtained a large amount of uh, safety protection items from them and the uh, LSU Health Science. Uh, the university is currently making level one PPE gowns and face shields uh, to help the needs of the universe, of the uh, hospitals and nursing homes. Uh, but supplies, like everyone else, has continued to be a uh, adjustment that we're having to go through. Absolutely, so it sounds like it's, it's so important to, um, to have people in place whose job it is to make these plans and respond to these complicated situations. So Laura, can you tell us why it's so important to, um, to have a campus emergency management program? Yeah, I think in instances like this, it really becomes the backbone of the institution. And I think we've learned over time that colleges and universities aren't immune from, from uh, tragic incidents. But as a community, we need to come together and be able to build, plan, train, and exercise in order to, to become resilient so that we can survive whatever is down the road. And I think this will be a telltale sign on how institutions of higher ed you know, have prepared for this and, and where they end up at the end of the day when, when the dust settles here. I, I think it would be difficult for a campus to navigate and manage through a scenario like this without an emergency management program. And I've often wondered, because I think we've had the luxury here at the university to be able to have a program that's strictly dedicated where individuals are dedicated to that mission of, of creating these plans and preparedness and training and exercise. You know, some of the small campuses, uh, you know, it, sometimes it's multiple hats that individuals are wearing. And having been in that situation before wearing a dual hat as an EHS director and EM director, it always seemed like environmental health and safety took precedence over some of the uh, issues that needed to be uh, addressed for emergency management because EHS is so heavily uh, involved in the regulatory and, and EM not so much. So it was always a balancing act. So I think having a dedicated program is extremely important and that, that really helps focus the efforts of the institution and really gets the, uh, the stakeholders within the institution behind a, a strong program. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it helps the leadership team in making decisions along with managing the incident. Uh, university leaders are often academics or business people, and they're counting on that emergency manager to guide them through difficult times. Uh, we, like most universities uh, in a emergency crisis, uh, find that we become an island quickly. Uh, the county, the parish, uh, do their thing, the state does their thing, and, and we're sitting there floating along. So we've got to have those uh, leadership guidelines uh, already on paper uh, to help us move forward. Um, so Bart, can you tell us, did you utilize a continuity of operations plan and what does that plan look like? Uh, the EOK, EOC core team, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we meet daily. Uh, the EOC director uh, meets with the university president and his senior team. Uh, all emergency operations are scalable. Uh, specific people are included or not included depending on the situation. Our continuity of operation plans were helpful. I, I think through the process though, we, we recognize that there's more detail that we need to capture in those plans or for the, from the individual units. 
they focus more our plans did on, on shorter term events and since this is going to be an extremely long event we're having discussions around what that's going to look like moving forward and how do we continue operations and even what are we going to do around the fall term we've made decisions to stay remote for spring summer but long term what does that look like and it's even forcing us to to redefine what essential functions might look like down the road absolutely so Laura, um, can you tell us a little bit how you go about establishing uh, an emergency operations center structure? Sure, I can do that. Um, you know, I think the EOC has to really fit the institution. And I understand, you know, working real close with our police department that, you know, on a college campus and most police departments use the ICS model. Uh, and we do that as well when it comes to field command in having conversations with you know, key folks, key stakeholders on our campus, uh, we decided pretty quickly that that type of structure was probably not gonna work for us. So we ended up adopting the uh, departmental model. We still have a policy team that's comprised of all of our senior leadership, which is our chancellor, provost, and the vice chancellors. But then we also have another group or team that's called CAS Coordination and Support Team. And this team is, is really a, a, a nice cross-section of the campus community, inclusive of emergency management, our police department, ITS, student life, academic affairs, our business office, HR, communications, facilities, risk management, general counsel, and procurement. And that helps us, you know, scale to an incident that we need, but it also supports any field operations that would, would be uh, needed. Uh, when they need support. So I think the structure works well for us, but what it also does is people get to continue to work within the teams that they do on a normal day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's where people are most comfortable to try to pull them out and you know, put them where there's a different reporting structure. I think that could make people feel very uncomfortable. And that was a lot of the feedback we had as we were developing our EOC structure. So the department model works very well for us. At LSU, we do uh, we do rely on, on NIMS, National Incident Management System, and ICS, Incident Command System, uh, to use to guide the development of the EOC. Uh, this came after Hurricane Katrina because the university did not have an EOC, uh, and the EOC was developed quickly as we became a, a need shelter uh, during that time. Uh, the core team has been valuable and keeping the uh, EOC stable as we change out university leaderships. Uh, we currently have an interim president now, uh, so that continues to change, but the core and the, the, the basic development is still in place, which helps us out in the long run. COVID was um, a growing crisis abroad for months before we really heard of the first cases in the U.S., even though they probably existed far, you know, long time before we knew about it. Um, did campus emergency management see this pandemic coming before COVID came to the U.S.? And if so, uh, when did you begin making that plan in advance? Um, Bart, could you respond to that? Yes, unfortunately, uh, my answer is going to be short. Uh, you know, we did have some suspicion and we saw what was going on abroad, uh, but we actually had no plans uh, here on campus. I think as Bart said, we had some indication that something was, was happening overseas. Um, one of the initial steps that we took early on, and it was actually before we broke for uh, the holiday back in December, was to actually uh, reach out to our global engagement team in our international office to really try to gain an understanding of you know what students might be traveling abroad over the holiday break and what that might look like when they come back as well as where we might have programs going out once we resumed uh, the the winter 2020 term so that was a little bit of the pre-planning we did initially before things really hit the u.s borders many institutes of higher education have infectious disease committees that were formed because of prior meningitis, measles, and H1N1 outbreaks in their respective communities. Do you have, have y'all utilized an infectious disease committee or something similar on your campus? And can you walk us through the steps that, you know, if so, can you walk us through the steps that um, this committee took to ensure safety on campus, Laura? 
Yeah, we have uh, our infectious disease committee is, is out of the main campus. So we were able to utilize some of the expertise that I mentioned earlier uh, from Michigan Medicine that they have. And again, I think, you know, it was, it was the information and intelligence that they were trying to gather around this virus that helped us make some decisions. So they were meeting on a regular basis and then sharing their information out to all of the campuses to help us plan. Uh, and as they gained additional insight and in some of the, the guidance that we were being provided early on was, you know, restricting travel to, to some of these areas now where we were seeing kind of this increase in cases. And we were actually working then with our international travel office to, to bring students, faculty and staff who may be traveling abroad back home. Um, they also advised us, um, which helped us make the decision to partially activate an EOC uh, for the, the university as a whole in late February, even though there were no confirmed cases in the state of Michigan. So that really helped us plan. And we started conversations well before uh, students came back for the spring. What would that, you know, from their spring break, what that would look like. So we were working on various scenarios. And during the, the spring break period, we actually quickly put together a, a tabletop exercise that is as an EOC, we went through and it, that really solidified some of the decision making and having those, those medical experts at the table from our infectious disease committee. It was extremely insightful and helpful in, in coming up with some of the strategies that we later were able to implement as we started looking at, you know, how do we minimize uh, the virus from spreading and, and really bringing down those densities across the campus was, was critical. So while we were having these conversations, you know, from that infectious disease committee and, and what does that look like for the, the future of the campus, uh, from a campus setting and academic setting. So as we were kind of thinking about how to spiral things down and reduce those densities, our, you know, our partners at Michigan Medicine were doing the exact opposite. They were looking at how they were going to ramp up operations um, for, you know, the, the onslaught of cases that they were going to see and patients that they were going to need to treat. So I think our infectious disease committee did a, a good job on keeping us prepared and maybe even a little bit ahead of the curve. We do not have an IDC. Uh, however, the uh, state, the uh, student health center here on main campus, those doctors, as well as uh, virus specialists at the LSU Vet School and environmental health and science were consulted and discussed uh, options and the best safety practices. Uh, as Laura, we have, uh, you know, we have students and faculty that were abroad. Uh, so we had to look at, uh, do they come back? When do they come back? And how does that fit in uh, as they come back in the United States and on campus? And Bart, um, how have you navigated through this crisis differently because it's a global pandemic and not something like a hurricane? Um, you know, which, you know, we've been through a few times now. Um, how has that been different? Well, I think our, our two major concerns uh, that we're going through right now is, and I mentioned one of them, but uh, budget and supplies. Uh, and the level of caution is significantly higher since the virus doesn't discriminate. Uh, we have consulted and included people remotely rather than using typical methods uh, as we are doing right now. Uh, so that's, uh, that's probably the new norm, even though we don't know what that norm is going to be. Uh, and we do know that things are going to change. We're not going to come back the same way. So we're just preparing for what that's going to look like. I think similar to what Bart said, you know, supplies are an issue. Budgets are, are going to be a big issue moving forward. I think it's how resilient can we be and how we can continue to serve our, our population, in particular our students. You know, we reside just uh, outside of the city of Detroit, and a lot of our population comes from, our student population comes from Detroit and Wayne County, uh, some of the, the two poor, poorest areas here in the state of Michigan, with, but with yet some of the highest cases. So we're really trying to navigate and, and understand what this looks like, because this will be probably a very long-term event. And typically some of the events, you know, that you mentioned, like hurricane or even active shooter, they're, you know, pretty over pretty quick. This is going to be something that we're all in it for the long haul. And I think that's really the dynamic that's very different here. So with the pandemic going on, there's been a lot of conversation regarding shortages of PPE. And Bart, you mentioned that a little bit, um, you know, not having enough of 
these supplies to supply to hospitals and um, to law enforcement and things like that. Has that has that been something that's impact your camp, impacted your campus or foresee it impacting, having a huge impact on your operations? Yes, of course, like normal, we'd reach out to the parish, the county, and uh, state resources. Uh, but as you mentioned, unlike a hurricane, uh, what happens in a hurricane situation, once the, the storm is over, and that's what some of our people are saying, when is the eye coming over? We should be finished by now. Uh, but we go to the unaffected areas uh, and get supplies. We've even had in the past where cooks will come in from other states, two or three states over. Uh, but at this point, there's none. There's no unaffected area. Uh, and that's why the university started looking at designs. Uh, we had a science professor actually came up with a plan to be able to make a PPE gown. Uh, the university uh, president saw what was going on, and we have moved that production uh, into our basketball arena, which has now become a production center. Uh, we have facility personnel, administration, NCBRT folks uh, making this product and shipping it out to assist uh, GOSEP and some of those uh, other areas, especially the nursing homes that have nothing. Uh, we have some of our smaller police departments that uh, two weeks ago uh, still did not have any equipment. Uh, so I think that's one of the main changes you'll see throughout the country uh, is, is is things change and we start looking at what the need is because uh, no one can tell us that it's not going to come back this time next year. Yeah, I think for us the PPE challenge was was a great one. You know, we've had some PPE in storage, you know, primarily to support research that was occurring on the campuses. Early on, you know, we knew there was a need for the hospitals for PPE. So we took a look at our inventories and uh, we donated what what we could. And you know now we're looking at how do we rebuild what we had so that we can return safely, and you know if we can return safely, and what does that PPE supply look like down the road? We've also shifted, you know, researchers have shifted what they've been working on, and some of them are working on COVID nineteen research. We've had our hospital uh, pharmacy team actually making uh, hand sanitizer, and our engineering uh, colleges are actually making face masks. So. You know, it's kind of an all hands on deck mentality and it's it's working. Do we have all the answers? No. We, you know, as Bart said, we know that, you know, we're kind of, even though we're all in this together, we have to figure out how we, you know, get out of this because uh, we can't rely on each other, not like in a typical natural disaster that may hit a specific area or region. Thank you to Laura and Bart for coming on the podcast and discussing some of the things they're doing to respond to the COVID-19 crisis on their campuses. Be sure to tune in next week as we continue our discussion with Laura and Bart. We'll be talking with them about things like communicating information to faculty, staff, students, and parents, bringing people back to campus, what keeps them awake at night regarding the future and COVID-19, and more. If you have any questions or topic suggestions for future episodes, please send us an email at podcast at ncbrt.lsu.edu. Make sure you subscribe to the LSU NCBRT Preparedness Podcast wherever you listen to podcasts, and we'll see you again next week.